Mark Golub, and in the news, ongoing reaction to the Trump administration's peace plan, which has as its goal an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a two-state solution that paves the way for a formal Palestinian state on roughly 70% of the West Bank and Gaza and parts of the Sinai, all thinly but assuredly connected one piece to the other by roads and a long, long tunnel. And the peace plan formally adds to the State of Israel key portions of the West Bank, including the entire Jordan Valley immediately west of the Jordan River, which means the formal border of the State of Israel would become the Jordan River. The plan also affirms Israel's right to military control of all of the West Bank, calls for a demilitarized Palestinian state, and has at its core a commitment to Israeli security and to Israeli control of all water rights. The plan also permits Israeli cities and towns to remain inside the Palestinian state, but under Israeli law so that no Israeli community will have to be disbanded or evacuated, as was the case in 2005 when Israel withdrew totally from Gaza. As I'm sure most of you know, most of the time the Palestinians have spoken about a two-state solution. They've spoken about it being, it being Judenrein, where Jews would be forbidden to live anywhere on the West Bank. In addition, the Trump administration peace plan states unequivocally that a united Jerusalem will remain the eternal and undivided capital of the state of Israel, although the plan includes a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem, where President Trump promises to open an American embassy. It's also important to note that the Trump administration peace plan conditions the creation of a Palestinian state on the Palestinians implementing a social transformation in which all violence, all incitement to violence, all anti-Israel education and propaganda, all pay for slay, in which individual Palestinians and their families are rewarded financially for murdering Jews. All of it must be repudiated and brought to an end. In Gaza, Hamas must be replaced by a nonviolent leadership which will no longer seek to eradicate the state of Israel. And as a condition for the creation of a Palestinian state, the Palestinians must formally recognize Israel as the Jewish state of the Jewish people. And as part of this formal recognition, the Palestinians must give up the right of return and agree that Palestinian refugees will be resettled in the new Palestinian state, not in the state of Israel. And if the Palestinians agree to what, in classic Trump hyperbole, is being called the deal of the century, if the Palestinians accept the plan and work over the next four years to implement the Trump administration peace plan, the new Palestinian state will receive $50 billion, $50 billion of financial aid and investment with which to develop their new state and bring a dramatic and welcome end to the economic squalor in which so many of the Palestinian people currently live, giving hope to Palestinian youth who've been held hostage by a Palestinian leadership that's been committed to an extreme jihadist philosophy in which the destruction of the infidel Jewish state has been more important than the quality of life of the Palestinian people. Now that's the essence of the Trump administration's peace plan. Though I also want you to see how the plan configures a Palestinian state on the West Bank with Israel retaining sovereignty of the Jordan Valley that runs along the Jordan River. Let's see one map here. 
here's a map of the post-67 Israel with the 1949 ceasefire line that's become the recognized border of the state of Israel, and the West Bank, which came under Israeli control in Israel's defensive war of 1967. Since Oslo, 1993 to 1995, the Palestinians have been given autonomy in Palestinian communities in roughly 40% of the West Bank, what the Oslo Accords designate as Area A of the West Bank. In Area A, which appears in yellow on this map of the West Bank, the Palestinians operate complete society of their own. Now you can see from this map, Area A is not one self-contained block of land, but Area A is spread throughout the West Bank. And wherever you see yellow on this map, the Palestinians have full autonomy over their lives. They have their own government, their own elections, they have their own police force, media, schools, hospitals, malls, an independent society of their own, with one exception. Israel retains military control, and the IDF has the right to enter any Palestinian city or village at any time to protect Israel from terrorism. As you look at this map, the rest of the West Bank is divided into Area B and Area C. Area B, which is represented by the brown areas on the map, are sort of a hybrid, shared control between Israel and the Palestinians. But Area C, the blue on this map, is the area controlled entirely by Israel. And the blue, which now is connected to the state of Israel, is where the majority of Jews live on the West Bank. They live in Area C, which as you can see from this map, is a large part of the existing West Bank. So what does the Trump administration peace plan propose for the West Bank? Let's look at their map. This is the map of the West Bank in the Trump administration peace plan. And the green that you see on this map represents what would become the new Palestinian state, while the brown on this map represents what will become part of the state of Israel under this plan. And the white dots you see with numbers in them represent Israeli towns and cities which will remain inside the Palestinian state, which will, which will be governed by Israeli law. Also note, to the right of the green area, Israel retains control over the strip of land along the Jordan River, known as the Jordan Valley. This is the Trump administration's conception of a two-state solution. Now, how is one to react to this Trump administration peace plan? I'll tell you my reaction, and then in a moment we'll hear how our panelists view it. For me, it's like a breath of fresh air to hear an American president really get it. To hear an American president say, if the Palestinians want a state of their own, we'll help make it happen. We'll fund it to the tune of $50 billion. But they first have to give up violence and all the hateful teachings about Jews, and they must recognize the legitimacy of the Jewish state of Israel and be willing to share the land with the Jewish people. That Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, even though the Palestinians can also have their capital in eastern Jerusalem. And that nothing will be done in a two-state peace agreement that jeopardizes Israeli security. Finally, an American president understands that as long as the Palestinian chant is, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. There's nothing 
Israel can do, nothing Israel can give, no policy Israel can change that will make peace possible. That the war the Palestinians have been waging against Israel has nothing to do with borders or land. It's an existential war with the express and sole purpose of destroying a nation state of the United Nations the Jewish state of Israel. And any time the Palestinians are prepared to truly make peace with the state of Israel, they can have a state of their own. Good for the president, who also expressed a commitment to the Palestinians. Palestinians have been trapped in a cycle of terrorism, poverty, and violence exploited by those seeking to use them as pawns to advance terrorism and extremism. The Palestinian people have grown distrustful after years of unfulfilled promises. So true. Yet I know they are ready to escape their tragic past and realize a great destiny. But we must break free of yesterday's failed approaches. This map will more than double the Palestinian territory and provide a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem, where America will proudly open an embassy. And good for Prime Minister Netanyahu, who made clear he is willing to negotiate with the Palestinians and is willing to see the creation of a Palestinian state. Mr. President, Israel wants the Palestinians to have a better life. We want them to have a future of national dignity, prosperity, and hope. Your peace plan offers the Palestinians such a future. Your peace plan offers the Palestinians a pathway to a future state. The Trump administration peace proposal is like a breath of fresh air and a statement ultimately of truth. And yet, I don't see how anyone can think that the Palestinians will be open one iota to the administration's plan. And in fact, the Palestinian reaction has been a resounding no. They refuse to participate in the process. They refuse now to even consider it. The Palestinian position is articulated by a Palestinian writing an op-ed in The Guardian saying, like much of what Trump has done in his time in office, this proposal says the quiet part out loud. So obvious is the contempt for Palestinians, so blatant is the racism. Time and again, Western proposals have divided, dismembered, and discarded Palestinians in an effort to gerrymander a Jewish minority in a land that has historically been overwhelmingly populated by Palestinians. Trump has laid bare his malicious vision. This is an opportunity for, for progressives, liberals, and people of conscience, including leaders in Congress, to take a stand. Will they stand on the side of apartheid? Or will they work to dismantle it with word and deed? Israel is an apartheid state. And as far as Palestinians are concerned, the Jews stole Palestinian land, and Israel is an illegal country. By the way, it's not only Palestinians who reject the new peace plan. For all the jubilation among those who attended the White House presentation, there are many Jews on the right who strongly oppose the Trump administration plan because they do not believe there should be another Arab Muslim state. They oppose the two-state solution. And there are Jews on the left who oppose the plan because it's being put forth by Donald Trump. 
There are Jews on the left who so despise Donald Trump. They are emotionally incapable of making a, a distinction between the man and his policies. And there's a third group. This group desperately wants to see an end to the violence and war and death that's been part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since before the Jewish state was born in 1948, but who simply don't believe the Palestinians will ever be ready to make peace with the state of Israel. And many of these are Israelis. You know, American Jews sometimes have a hard time understanding the Israeli mentality and how much Israelis are prepared to compromise to put an end to war with the Arab world. Since the end of the Vietnam War, when America replaced the draft with a volunteer army, an American Jewish soldier is a virtual anomaly. Most American Jewish mothers do not spend sleepless nights worrying about their children in Afghanistan or in Iraq. But in Israel, virtually every child becomes a soldier after high school. And Israeli mothers and fathers spend many painful, sleepless nights and days worrying about the safety of their children in the IDF, hoping and praying that they will complete their years of service and return home in one piece. For the Israeli people, there is the eternal hope of every succeeding generation that their grandchildren will not need to serve in the IDF in battle. The Israeli people want peace with the Palestinians desperately, more than any American Jew can ever imagine. But the question remains, is the Trump administration peace plan a realistic path toward that end? Or does it require a suspension of disbelief? The way people must suspend disbelief to enjoy a Quentin Tarantino movie or one of those Marvel superhero movies. Does a Trump administration peace plan require a suspension of disbelief? Or does it have any real chance of bearing fruit. Well, for some insight and analysis of the Trump administration peace plan, I am honored to be sitting with four individuals who are profoundly committed to the state of Israel and involved in Jewish life, American and Israeli, and I'm most anxious to hear their views of this peace plan. You know them all, but let me reintroduce them to you. Steve Bain is the American Jewish Committee's Director of Contemporary Jewish Life and of the AJC's Koppelman Institute on American-Jewish-Israeli Relations. Steve is an essayist and author who lectures on Israeli issues and lectures throughout the country on issues challenging American Jewish life. Denny Ayalone is the distinguished former Israeli ambassador to the United States he is also a former deputy foreign minister of the state of Israel, and he is one of the most highly respected of Israeli diplomats. Denny Ayalon is also the host of a series of educational videos we are honored to show here on JBS so often, entitled The Truth About Israel, and it is always a pleasure to have Danny with us here on JBS. Eric Mandel is director of the Middle East Political Information Network, and regularly briefs members of the Senate, House, and their foreign policy advisors on matters pertaining to U.S.-Israeli relations. Eric is also senior editor for security at the Jerusalem Report, and he joins us for this first time here on JBS. And we're also joined by Shachar Azani, who also has a long and impressive history of service in the Israeli diplomatic service for many years, Shachar served as the media counsel for the Israeli consulate here in New York, which is how, to my good fortune, I came to know him very well. Shachar moved from the consulate to stand with us, 
where he built the campus organization's Northeast region. And I am now thrilled to be able to say that Chuck Arazani is part of the JBS family, serving as JBS's senior vice president. It is such a wonderful joy for me to have, be sitting with all four of you. Thank you so much for joining us here on JBS to discuss a matter that is you know, front and center in the news. And Steve, I want to begin with you. You heard my open. I want you to speak to the, you know, the two issues that I, I find to be most relevant to any discussion. What's the strength, from your perspective, of the Trump peace plan? What's the weakness? And is it realistic, in your view? Well, first of all, it was a superb presentation, Mark. In other words, you. your, your intro really was marvelous just to, just to listen to, and it really covered all the bases. But essentially, I would say the plan has three major strengths. Um, number one, and uh, this to me was a, a source of enormous concern in the days leading up to the plan, to its release, uh, is that the plan reaffirms the two-state solution. Mm -hmm. uh, my concern had been that the two-state solution was going into eclipse. At HAC, we've argued for quite a quite good number of years, it's the only realistic solution to the Middle East conflict. The fact that the Prime Minister, who frankly a, a, a mere four years ago, went on television and said, there will be no Palestinian state on my watch. He was unequivocal about that. Um, he reaffirmed his support for it. Mm -hmm. All those are of enormous consequence. Mm -hmm. The point you made about the uh, embassy in East Jerusalem, uh, the fact is when, I think on this program, uh, when we had a, a, a debriefing or a panel discussion about the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moving the embassy, I said then I would have preferred if Trump had made the move accompanied by a statement of, I look forward to the day when there'll be an American embassy in East Jerusalem. Well, you just saw it. And in that respect, I think the plan has some very strong virtues. Uh, as far as Israel is concerned, the plan addresses Israel's very legitimate security needs. The problem with the two-state solution was the issue of, will it really be a demilitarized state? Uh, or is it going to be another, uh, I don't know, Lebanon, you know, a state of uh, uh, wild and irrational action that, frankly, threatens the lives of individuals? There were others who argued to be a... Uh, a, a revanchist state, in other words, a, a, a redentist state to reclaim the historical land of Palestine, a state perhaps sponsoring terrorism. The insistence that the state be demilitarized uh, addresses a great many of Israel's security concerns. Uh, add to that the fact that it also eliminates any, any talk about a right of return, which is both a matter of principle and a matter of security. By saying there'll be no right of return, again, a very important statement that I think enjoys a very broad consensus with an Israeli society, frankly, on both the right and on the left. I can think of very few Israelis I know, if any, who would say there should be a Palestinian right of return when you have a Palestinian state that they have every right to return to, but not a state, not a state of Israel. Thirdly, I'd suggest that the, um, uh, the plan is uh, also very powerful in turn, or very, very attractive in the sense that um, it, um, it's a starting point for returning to the table. Um, uh, in other words, again, I have no illusions that negotiations will begin tomorrow or next week, next month, maybe even not, not next year. But one thing is guaranteed is that um, without negotiations, without people sitting across the table, direct face-to-face, -face, uh, Israel always insisted on this point in the sense that um, you can't make peace with someone if you're not willing to recognize that person's humanity. Um, so in that sense, the plan serves as a possible starting point for return to negotiations. Now, what are its drawbacks? What are its weaknesses? Take that last point. The fact of the matter is we would not be sitting here, nor would Trump have ever issued his, his statement, there would be no need for it, if the Palestinians had accepted the Olmert plan, which is only 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Perhaps more importantly, if the Palestinians had accepted the UN partition plan of 1947, there would have been a Palestinian state coexisting alongside Israel seven decades later. And that, that Palestinian state, um, in many ways, was parallel to a Jewish state that was also discontiguous. In other words, it was not, it was not a contiguous Jewish state. Ben-Gurion, in his wisdom, and Israeli society backed him, as they said, basically, let's take half a loaf as better than nothing. The Palestinians have never been willing to satisfy themselves with half a loaf. So the fact that Palestinians have not participated in this process, refused to participate, um, 
I think one of the real important lessons of the history of diplomacy here is that progress has been made on the peace process, if you will, on the peace front, only when it began between Israel and her adversaries, and then the United States moved in to help facilitate it. That certainly was the case with Egypt and with Jordan. Um, in this case, where America and Israel have essentially spent a great deal of time dotting their I's and crossing the T's, the absence of the Palestinians' involvement in any shape, manner, or form is a major drawback. Secondly, the issue I just raised before is that um, um, for a Palestinian state to be viable, the issue of contiguity has to be kept in mind. In other words, will it be a, continu a, contig a contiguous state or will it be divided up into parts? Now, again, no party is going to be satisfied with every point in the Trump plan. And that's an area where if they're dissatisfied with it, great. Uh, come to the table, talk about it. It's a legitimate negotiating point. Um, but again, the, one of the drawbacks is that the Palestinian state that's envisioned here is not really a contiguous state, although technically one could see it that way, but in practice it, it won't be. And thirdly, I'd say the, uh, the other drawback is really has to do with American politics, and that is that um, previous uh, initiatives uh, regarding uh, uh, the future of the Middle East and Israel's relationship with their adversaries have always been bipartisan in nature. Um, in other words, they were supported by Democrats, supported by Republicans. One of my real problems with Donald Trump um, is that the relationship has become much more of a partisan one. The drawback for Israel is that in a two-party system, inevitably the other party is going to come back to power. The fact that they have not bought into this plan means, number one, that uh, there's a real danger as to what happens when the Democrats do, do return to power. Obviously, there's concern within Ameri the American Jewish community that will the left wing of the Democratic Party, which in many ways has turned hostile to Israel, will that left wing be contained? Perhaps yes, perhaps not, and again, obviously American Jews have to uh, look at this and monitor the situation very carefully, but obviously our experience with uh, several members of that left-wing Democratic Party has not been, a very, uh, not been a very favorable one. But even assuming that left-wing is contained, the reality that there was no Democratic involvement in any kind of development of this peace process means that a future Democratic administration will probably be far less committed to it, as already evidenced by the fact that you had 12 senators uh, writing, writing to the president saying this plan is uh, an absolute disaster. So I am concerned about will the future uh, pattern of U.S.-Israel relations remain a bipartisan one. Now, as far as your, um, your last question goes about does the plan have a future, again, I don't think there's anyone, I can't speak for the members of the panel here, but um, I can't think of anyone that, uh, that I know well, either in Israel or in America, that really believes a two-state solution is on the horizon. Uh, it's not going to come soon. I think I've said on this program, it's not going to come in my lifetime, although hopefully I'll live many, many, many more years. Um, but that said, um, if the plan has no immediate future, the real point is, is that it reaffirms the two-state solution as the sole realistic solution. The message to the Palestinians is, if you want to keep this as an archival matter, as simply a, a matter of memory, consign it to the dustbin, then continue to stay away. Um, the status quo, as difficult as it is, is um, preferable, if you will, to all-out war, is preferable to uh, uh, a, a total collapse of relations. But um, if you do want to see any progress, the only way of making progress is direct, face-to-face -face negotiations. Take this plan, say that not every item is acceptable. There are items that are unacceptable, there are items that are acceptable. There are things we have to work on. But ignoring it, dismissing it, saying it's a form of uh, uh, Bantustan or whatever other language has been used is really a, simply a way of no progress in the area whatsoever. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Danny, you come from this uh, from a different perspective because you are not only Israeli, but you have you've been in the halls of diplomacy. You've sat in some very important negotiations yourself. I'm, I've been, you know, you and I spoke for a few moments on the, on, I, no, Shekhar, you and Danny spoke on the phone when the, the day the, uh, the White House had the conference and you were kind enough to be on the phone from Israel with, with, uh, with uh, Shekhar and Tisha. But I want to hear you expound a little bit on my three questions. Number one, what's its strengths? What's its weakness from your perspective? And is there anything realistic here in this peace plan? Well, it's a good plan. 
it's a good plan on both accounts of realism and balance. And I would say that this is the first plan that I see where the playing fields are balanced for Israel. You see, all these plans before that I have been also party of, and some of them I endorsed, but this was before major changes in the area, geopolitical, which, you know, you cannot really keep history from moving along. And this is where I really feel for the Palestinians who have always l missed all the opportunities, all the trains that they never boarded on. Now, by uh, leveling the playing fields, I mostly refer to security. If you compare this plan to all other plans, some of them were endorsed by former Israeli uh, governments, but rejected, of course, by the Palestinians, is the fact that security in the Trump's plan is not just a lip service. It's what really can ensure defensible borders for Israel, can really ensure security in, the, in a real sense that can really keep the Jewish state safe, secure, defendable for generations to come. And what makes it really secure is the fact that the Jordan Valley will be kept in Israeli hands, the Judean hills around Jerusalem and the high ground will be in Israeli hands, and without these two strategic areas, you cannot really defend the state of Israel. Um, you know, the width of the, state of the state of Israel from the sea to the former 67 lines were only eight miles. What is it? Less than half of Manhattan. So uh, Israelis in the past did accept a plan of total withdrawal to 67 borders almost, but provided the Palestinians really will reject, renounce violence, terrorism, incitement, pay to slay, and uh, everything that uh, we know is bad in the Palestinian society. But this never happened. And probably it will never happen again. Israel also, we have really bad experience from any international guarantees because uh, part of the plans before, and especially it was during the, um, the, the John Kerry negotiations under uh, Obama, was that some international troops will secure Israel along the Jordan Valley. Well, we have had that before to no avail. In 1967, we had peacekeeping forces supposedly to prevent a war with Egypt on the one call from uh, Gamal Nasser, they just fled the area. So we cannot um, really take seriously any international guarantees like many other countries cannot. You see how many um, papers, you know, which suffered or, or absorbed all kinds of plans, but when it came to reality, they just were crashed. And, and this is the situation now. So to the extent that Israel will retain the ability to defend itself by itself, this will keep this uh, plan viable and for generations to come without any tempts, temptations from anybody to attack the state of Israel. Okay. So it will contribute a lot to the stability of the region. From your view, does the plan have any weaknesses? Well, you would say the weakness is, of course, that the Palestinians were not engaged, but this is not a weakness of the plan. Correct. This is the weakness of the Palestinians. But what else is new? They have rejected all plans for the last 100 years. I mean, we can talk already, you know, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, and then, of course, the Peel Commission of 36, 47, 67, the three no's of Khartoum, 2000, 2008, and I would say also 2015 and 16, when President Obama and John Kerry were really coming very close. Bibi Netanyahu, Likud, was willing to really make a long, to go a long way towards the Palestinians. But what broke the, the, the entire concept was that they refused to rec recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Okay. So from your perspective, Danny, is this a realistic plan? Do you say to yourself, this is a plan that would interest the Palestinians? Because if it doesn't interest the Palestinians, it's not a realistic plan. So my question here is, given the history, long and short, was there any plan that really interested the Palestinians? Not yet. Not yet. Does this one? Well, oh, wait, I hope this so. This one gives the Palestinians. You know, let's put <coughs> the, uh, the map again 
of the Trump plan. This, this plan, the Trump plan, gives the Palestinians less land than Omert and Barak, Ehud Barak, offered. And the Palestinians turned it down. <coughs> Why should anyone, Jew or non-Jew, Republican or Democrat, Israeli or American, or British or French, why should anyone, as much as, again, I loved the way the president articulated the conflict and the solution. I loved it. As far as I'm concerned, it's long overdue. But I'm saying to myself, I can't see anything, anything about this plan that would be attractive to the Palestinians. And to the, so I say to myself, well, I'm glad he did it. I'm glad he said it. I made me feel good. I think he told the truth. And I hope it exposes the extent to which the Palestinians really have no interest in peace. But, Danny, I don't see anything about this plan that would interest the Palestinians. Unless they have no other choice. You right. see, I believe that the succeeding uh, Palestinian leadership betrayed the national interest of their own people to the extent of, I would say, um, criminal neglect, if not even more. But uh, what is interesting here, and kudos for the administration and Trump, is that he secured the support of major Arab countries. The fact that three Arab countries uh, were represented in the conference two, three days ago in the White House, um, the Bahrain and uh, oh, Oman, my. and of course the Emirates, and they wouldn't be there without the support, at least tacit support of the Saudis. Uh, we see the reaction, which was not outright rejection, not by Jordan, not by Egypt, even if they are not very happy about it, they are not going to object and that they are not going to throw, you know, any obstacles to... Uh, right. How does that help? Well, that helps because the Palestinians cannot rely, hopefully, on what we used to call or still call the automatic majority of the Arabs and Muslim countries that would pounce on, the, on this uh, plan, will... Uh, raise international uh, support or international objection to the plan, it is going to be much more difficult for them. Boris Johnson of Britain endorsed it. The Europeans, as Europeans, you know, they didn't reject, they didn't object, but, you know, they will study it. But this is a, at least a lukewarm and not a very cold shoulder uh, to this. We mentioned the Arab countries. And hopefully, and hopefully, and this is something that uh, the Palestinians will have to really look hard and long inwards, will they miss maybe the last opportunity ever for them to become independent? Because I mentioned this, this plan is balanced. Why is it balanced? Because there is this, what is used now very much, this term of quid pro quo, or I would say the trade-off. The trade-off here is very reasonable. That is security and recognition for the state of Israel, nationality, sovereignty, independence, to the Palestinian state. Now they can come and say, well, it's a hodgepodge, it's not contiguous. Well, first of all, it is contiguous. You know, otherwise Israel would not be contiguous uh, with this uh, connection between Gaza and, uh, and the West Bank. I think there is a good um, solution that was found. But what is this contiguity? There are so many other countries who are not contiguous. Does that uh, impede on their national uh, uh, indignity or on their national conduct or on their economy? I mean, there are countries, Indonesia of one, Japan, who are made of thousands of small islands. This is not contiguous. So again, if they will go into uh, obstinance and going into some points which are really irrelevant to the region, even to themselves, then again, they will miss the boat. So in that respect, I think what we see here in Trump that he really offered you said very eloquently, Mark, a breath of fresh air. And he really looked at things as if new. Nothing was axiomatic. See, five presidents before him, from Lyndon Johnson on, tried the same thing over and over and over again, only to find themselves hitting a brick wall before, because of Palestinians' intransigence. Here, and you know, this is what Einstein said is insanity, right? You try the same thing over and over, hoping for a different result. Trump, and maybe because of his business acumen, I don't know, he said, 
I take nothing for granted. I, th I take nothing as sacred. Who said the 67 borders is a sacred thing? The Palestinians over the years made it look like, like this is, you know, the only way to go ahead. And they had the majority in the UN and they had the Arab countries with then the uh, power of oil. So they had their way. Well, no more. There is a new president who is looking at things from a very balanced, fresh, and I would say objective position. And also the geopolitics are different. Okay. Beautifully said. Eric, you deal with members of Congress all the time. Leaving even the partisan issue out, the question is, to what extent does this seem like a plan which has a reasonable uh, possibility of the Palestinians accepting it? Danny has given some reasons why it might. What's your sense? Well, the first thing here is I actually think this is groundbreaking. And the reason this is groundbreaking, yes, it's all true that they would be getting a lot less than the Omer plan, than in Barak, um, and Taba, all of those other things. It's groundbreaking because what Danny said is that the Arab countries, the UAE, even, even Qatar, had a almost a lukewarm response, which was shocking considering that they're the home of Al Jazeera and their relationship with Iran. Obviously, the Saudis gave acquiescence for others, that has changed everything. So it doesn't almost matter what this plan is, it's been what the reaction is. The Arab countries, certainly the Gulf countries, want to deal with Israel. They, all, they have both a security reason they want to be beyond the clandestine talks that they have regarding security and intelligence regarding Iran. I think they want to have an open, they want to become more successful. The Palestinian issue has not been a territorial issue, it's been an existential issue, which is what we allude to, why we don't think it's going to resolve any time necessarily soon, but I never say never. Uh, there's always things, nobody saw the Arab Spring, Arab Winter coming, things happen that we, we're not prepared for. So I think this is huge and different. What your specific question was on what happens in Congress, it's a hyper-polarized place. Anything that comes out of the president's mouth is immediately dismissed, even if it's something that a Democratic president would be accepted if they said. Um, and it goes both ways. Um, it's, it's very hard where I used to be able to do business in a bipartisan way. Um, you really can't get things done. There is, a, unfortunately, a growing hostile part of the Democratic Party that is against Israel. The traditional pro-Israel Democrats are on the defensive. Again, having said that, and knowing that the greater Arab world has not rejected this, and knowing that Iran is America's number one threat in the region, so there is a, both a geopolitical region, a political reason to come together and to go forward here. But how should one go forward before this ends up in the dustbin like all the others? One of the things here is in, we project our Western perspective in a different part of the world. It's not being condescending, but it's understanding a different part of the world. And I think one of the things that we need to say and the President should talk about is respecting the Palestinian narrative. The narrative of their displacement. Remember, they've unfortunately been brainwashed in a lot of things that are basically anti-Semitic, but they've also been brainwashed of a lot of things that aren't true, not even facts out of context, facts not, not context, um, about the Nakba and things like that. But I think a healthy respect for acknowledging what they see the reality is, I mean, their nationalism is very much based upon the negation of another people. It doesn't have the positive attributes of other people because, in essence, these people were Palestinian Arab people, were Palestinians are relatively new nationalism that we have to respect, but they look differently. They define themselves about what they don't have. And so I think that's one of the ways we could reach out. Um, the president has changed the playing field because for the first time he has said it will not be what would, the West has always done, is that we will give more and more if they threaten violence or, um, or, or whatever their threats are, and Israel has to give more. If we only give more, they'll, they will have finally peace. In this part of the world, that doesn't kind of work in the negotiations. And so there's been some consequences here. And the Palestinians who have been all or nothing are going to need to reevaluate it. The people who are really going to enjoy this at this point of time, 
tremendous sense of relief. I have a piece coming out in the Jerusalem Report on Jordan. The Jordanians are thrilled. Why? Because the last thing they wanted was a Palestinian state within the 67 lines of never a border, the armistice line, that could turn into Hamistan and threaten their Palestinian majority. The idea that the Israelis are going to control the Jordan River Valley. And by the way, anybody who thinks that Israel is not going to get the Jordan River Valley, no matter what, as an, in, across the whole political world there, knowing with Iran encircling Israel, literally being on the Jordanian border in Syria, in Lebanon, that has to be in Israeli control. So here I have the, a half glass full, mainly because on the macro level, this hasn't been rejected. And so if you want, I'll just give you one thing about uh, maybe a negative of some of the things I see here. I don't know how Israel is going to be able to protect isolated settlements within a Palestinian state. I know they'll have military there's control. There's going to be peace. What? Well, this I, only works if there's peace. Why are you worrying about <coughs> them being protected? Okay. If, if you worry about them being protected, you don't believe there's peace. Yeah, I don't use the word peace. The word is a long-term sustainable ceasefire with a certain level of respect. Maybe peace is uh, just long-term ceasefires. But to, you know, the idea of a Western peace between America and Canada or America and, and, and that's not happening. I'll, Eric, I'll, do, I'll take any word you want, any concept. If you worried about Israeli settlements, which are really communities, cities and towns, inside the new Palestinian state, then you don't believe in this process. I believe in the process. I think if, this, if there was really a commitment to a peace, as you would say, or a ceasefire, those settlements will be harder to, to defend, the, even with all the security that's there. Israel, the Why will they need to be defended? Because in this part of the world, in a world of tribal natures who doesn't look at things this way, and that anti-Semitism and Israel's right to exist in a land that was once Islamic is not going away totally. And so the, you have to do what President Reagan said, trust, but verify. You have to be able to verify, and you have to be able to protect the people easily. And I think the end deal here, if there was going to be a deal, is Israel would end up giving up the small number of settlements that are within and totally encircled by a Palestinian state. And Israel, of course, will keep the major settlement blocks. So I'm just saying I think that's a weakness of the plan. I think that's a bargaining chip that was put in there. Fair enough. You've been so patient, Shahar. Oh, just <laughs> wisening up as I listen to, to your overview and these wonderful overviews. Okay, you've now heard three mm -hmm. overviews, okay? Yep. And I'm putting it to you, and I'm a little bit surprised as I listen, because I think the analysis is fascinating, but I'm surprised at the bottom line, because I keep saying to myself, the bottom line is you're dealing with a Palestinian mentality, by the way, it's not that they're bad people. They believe in their heart that this land is theirs. I read, by the way, could we put up the first page of the editorial that we read from The Guardian? Yeah, Yusuf because, uh, I'm sorry? Yusuf Munayar. Yes. The author, yeah. If we have it, please put it up one more time. Right. And <clears throat> what he said was, uh, time and again, Western proposals have divided, dismembered, and discarded Palestinians, in an effort to gerrymander a Jewish minority in a land, now look at this next line, that has historically been overwhelmingly populated by, populated by Palestinians. Shahar, is that true? <laughs> let me is just it take true? You, let me take you a word before. You're troubled by the, uh, by the, uh, the, the facts or the non-existent realities that Yusuf Munayer presents. What about gerrymandering? He has a direct intention here to use the certain term that is at the very heart of political discussion yes. here in the U.S. Yes. and rally the progressive forces against Trump. And this takes me to my point. What can I add to all that's been said? I'll say that the strength of the plan, that this is Trump. It's Trump in all of its Trumpism. It's not a plan waiting for Palestinian approval or rejection, and then if they say nothing, nothing happens. The train is chugging at the station. The smoke is billowing off the engine. What train? It's ready to go. What train? The train of actual 
uh, um, measures on the ground, similar to revoking budget from UNRWA, moving the American embassy to Jerusalem, acknowledging Israeli sovereignty in the Golan Heights. For the first time, Palestinian intransigence meets with a price that says that if you do not jump on this train, it's going to get more and more difficult, and you may get wounded on the way and lose uh, properties on the ground, and that in itself is, if there is any sliver of hope that the Palestinians may behave differently, as much as they, they have, as, as much as there is any chance for such hope, it's there. And there comes the weakness of the plan, because it's Trump. And we live in a world where everything Trump cannot be observed. So anybody who detests Trump will not even look in the direction of a plan that tries to gerrymander Palestinians. But anybody who loves Trump may say, well, you know, it's Trump. It's, it's, it's great what he's doing. But the truth is that even if it's a president you may disagree with, the measures taken are wise. And yes, a word that Ambassador Ayalon used, realistic acknowledging reality on the ground. Jerusalem has been Israel's capital. It, it has all of Israeli institutions. There is nothing huge about acknowledging a fact on the ground that has been there for so many decades, rather than feeding into the Palestinians' delusions and hallucinations that there was never a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In your opinion, does this plan have any chance of attracting Palestinian support? If you ask me about all of the plans before, including Kerry's, zero, bearing in mind Palestinian rejectionism, Trump, 1%. Maybe there is somebody on the Palestinian side who's going to say, you know what, this Mubarak, the former uh, Egyptian president, once said, a very good trait for a leader is to be magnoon, crazy. You have to be a bit crazy. That works. If they, there is somebody sitting in a Bamukata in Ramallah and says, this, this president is, is crazy. We can't anticipate what he's going to do. One moment he wants to appease Iran, the other he's uh, getting rid of Qasem Soleimani. Let's just, you know, hedge our bets here. Maybe we should say, as the Abu Ziyad published, one of the Palestinian thinkers and leaders published an op-ed saying, you know what, let's just say, thank you, President Trump, for your attempt. We're willing to negotiate. Let's discuss and maybe try to salvage What do you think something. of that? About that statement? Yeah. Very savvy. Savvy. Very smart. Explain the, to the audience why. <laughs> because it makes sense and it goes beyond the usual knee-jerk reaction of Palestinians to reject and involves thinking in how to make the most out of the process, thinking that had it been in place in 1947, we would have seen a very different Israel. Because? Because we would have accepted the partition resolution and Israel would have been uh, uh, discontinuous on 22% of the Okay. Land. Do I understand Shachar Azani to be saying he believes that the Palestinian mentality can in fact give up this ultimate goal of eliminating any infidel state on land that was once under the sovereignty of the Muslim world? Nothing in the... In the um in the words of uh, peace and messianic expressions of giving up hopes and dreams, but everything in relation to what Dr. Mandel said, realism. Are we able to achieve some sort of a regional settlement based on foundations that will help us maintain more and more assets and lose less under the presidency of somebody whose behavior we can't anticipate? Yes, I believe there is hope. Interesting. As you hear all this, any reaction? I think there are several points. I mean, we've heard some very wise and penetrating things. Uh, several points I think are worth picking up on, and some things have not been raised. Um, one issue that was raised that is, was only raised, you know, by, by in passing. You raised the question of why are you concerned with outlying settlements? If there's peace, there's peace. There is something that we need to face internally. Uh, a declaration this morning by 400 rabbis in Israel that said this plan is absolutely terrible because surrendering one inch of the Holy Land is against God's Torah, and therefore it must be resisted. But who do they represent? They represent a lot of the people that you're talking about in terms of the outlying settlements. In other words, they may not represent Israeli society, but they are a current, and they are particularly evident in some of these outlying settlements like Hebron. If so, I may interject, Steve, for sure. just one second. You know, Israel is a pluralistic, democratic society with a rule of law. I wouldn't be so much concerned, like uh, we were concerned, of course, but the results were during the 2005 disengagement for Gaza, which was a painful exercise. The cruise, you know, uh, really, uh, what do you call it? Excruciating. Excruciating uh, uh, national um, It tore at the Israeli thing. heart. 
Yeah. And, and, and there, more than 400 rabbis were all against it. Not one blood, drop of Jewish blood was shed because at the end of the day, majority, majority rule, of course we have to keep the minority rights, but Israel is a democracy and whatever the government decides will prevail. I think that's fair in terms of forecasting the future. Will, that, will there be difficulties along the way in terms of this? I don't see how we can ignore that. Look, there are 10,000 settlers today that are quite literally an illegal outpost. Those are illegal settlements. The government repeatedly, and once I must say at a meeting I had with you when I brought university presidents to Israel, you said I think quite explicitly they must be removed. Um, they have not been removed. Would they be removed under this plan? Again, I don't think the plan is, has much of a chance of going much further, so therefore it probably won't be tested that way. But would those 10,000 settlers be a problem? I think they certainly would be a problem. What kind of problem? I don't understand. How can they be a problem? By the way, if you want, you, it, I don't think you believe this. You said you don't think it's going to happen in your lifetime. Yeah. You're going to live to 120, by the way. But, <laughs> but if, if you think that, what, what do you mean it's, it, it's going to be a problem? For what? How? It's not relevant. Let's you know, I, I keep hearing Jews talk as if this, there's a real possibility for peace. And I hear people say, you know what problem with this Trump plan is? It has put, all, but we, we're gonna, we may get to it in this show. All of the people who are running to be, for their parties, the, the Democratic nomination for president, every one of them came out criticizing this plan. And they criticized it because it was unilateral, because the Palestinians weren't involved in the plan. By the way, Israel tried to involve the Palestinians. They didn't want to be involved. But on the one hand, you know, we've talked about it already. We're not surprised that Democrats are criticizing a Trump plan. There's nothing surprising there. But I hear Jews talking about, well, this is going to push peace away, as if peace is possible. I don't think any of the four of you believe that in the past, certainly 20, 25 years since Oslo, you have any real indication that this narrative that you refer to, a word that drives me crazy, narrative is a story. There is fact, and then there's narrative. It's unacceptable for the Jewish people and for Americans to accept a narrative that has no basis in reality. I'm sorry Palestinians feel bad. I'd love there to be a way to make everybody happy. But Israel didn't do this to anybody. Israel didn't steal a land. Didn't steal a land from anybody. That's the narrative. Finally, we have a president who says, I'm not buying into the narrative. But I hear, is, I hear Jews talking as if peace is possible only if. And yet I say to myself, with whom? given the mentality of the Israel of the Palestinian people who do this out of the conviction of their heart. So then when you talk about well ten, you know, four thousand four hundred rabbis say this, that or the other thing, so what? No, the so the so what basically is is that the, the problem with that <coughs> Palestinian theology might be a better word than narrative. Good for the problem, you. The problem with that Palestinian theology is that the existence of a Jewish state on what was once Dar al-Islam, territory Correct. of Islam. Correct. The existence of a Dar al-Islam reverting back to Dar al-Harb, territory of the nations, including obviously a Jewish state, that is theological sin. Sin. Okay. That is a real obstacle to peace. Isn't it? Okay. Now, by the same token, I wouldn't equate the two by any stretch of imagination because they can be contained much more easily. But you also have a extremist Jewish theology. There is no compatible, and I think what Danny said says it all. Do we have Jewish extremists? Do we have Jews on the right? Who are, and, and people get angry at me, but they're, they're nuts. Okay. But they also have their convictions. But they are part of a democratic society, and if Israel could have peace with the Palestinians and give up Everything that, that Barack wanted to give up and everything that Omer wanted to give up and they give up even East Jerusalem, I believe, in a heartbeat. If your grandchildren never had to serve in the IDF and never had to go to war and never had to serve in the Gaza Strip or in Lebanon, 
or, or, or police the West Bank. That would be a dream come true. And you'd give, I would give up, and you'd give up. And 400 extremists, 10,000 extremists <coughs> mean nothing in that context. In the larger sphere, I think you're absolutely correct. I think uh, Eric's point was, will these outlying settlements be difficult to defend? They'll be very difficult to defend if they're populated by extremists. You think, you know, um, a couple of possibilities, because we, we do think, if we, are, if we are considering Israel's security needs, and that's what I do, could one of these isolated settlements with extremist ideology set off a match in a kerosene bin by doing some actions outside these settlements that could create conflict? That is a possibility. We do have seen uh, price tag account uh, things that have occurred. The reason is I don't like the idea fundamentally of putting Jewish civilians no matter, surrounded by Palestinian Arabs who will, who could not, who will not be defending them if there are some riots and things like that. I think that's a provocation that is not in the best, a best part of a plan. Danny, what do you think? Well, it goes down to what you said. It's a matter of relationship. At the end of the day, it's not the borders, it's not the formalities, it's not the papers. It's reality on the ground. Where, will we have a, a relationship like the U.S. with Canada or the Benelux, Belgium and Holland? I don't know. But this is the vision. This is the dream of, of uh, every plan. And certainly this plan can bring it to reality better and faster than any of the previous plans. It may take a hundred years, mm. but still, you can still try. That's still faster. It, yeah. it, what do you th uh, the I'll just say that the, the, the whole idea of these supposedly extremists in the enclaves is ridiculous for one reason. Hamas's charter doesn't say, let every extremist settler who lives in an enclave know when you're behind a tree or a rock, let the tree and rock move so that I can kill you. The word they use is Jew. For them, sometimes the incitement is the very fact that I breathe and eat and sleep and exist in my own land. And whether it needs to be removed or not, hallelujah, the door is open. Four years of negotiations. Let Saeb Erekat march in and negotiate. And I'm sure any goat that may have found its way into the negotiating room may find its way out. But the door, as, as the president mentioned, if there is direct negotiations, there is chance. If not, things might happen on the ground that... Nobody can predict, right? But once Shaha said that's really important, when I'm in the Arab world, they're not people who live in Israel who are Jewish are not referred to as Israelis, they're referred to as Jews. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's an important distinction. The Israelis are Jews. And it gets into our definitions of anti-Semitism and how they perceive Jews here. And so I think it's, that's actually a point that really needs to be brought out. And thank right. you for, for doing that. Right. Okay. I keep saying to the four of you, I loved hearing Trump speak. And I love the fact that an American president, in my mind, got it. This has been so obvious to me. It's been infuriating to me that administration after administration, Democrat and Republican, hasn't seen it. But I, as much as I loved what I heard, I said to myself, what world is this man living in? What world is Jared Kushner living in? And I want, you know, I expected the four of you to say, yeah, we liked the plan, you didn't like the plan, you thought it was strengths, you had weaknesses. It's, it's not a viable plan because you don't have an interlocutor on the other side. I expected to hear that from all four of you, and I haven't. By the way, maybe it's, you know, this, this Jewish messianic quest that we, we always want to believe and we want to hope and we don't want to say things that seem to, you know, squash us and squash hope. I hope, I believe in the Israeli people, by the way. I believe, as I said just a moment ago to Steve, I believe if there was an honest interlocutor on the other side, the Israelis would give up everything that they needed to so their children wouldn't have to. And they, that, they'd help build the Palestinian world, and they wouldn't need $50 billion from Trump. Israel, you know, Paris already said we're going to pump money in. This is nothing new, but, it, but there's a reality here. And ultimately, the only thing that could make this happen, and I haven't heard it from any of the four of you, is if there yeah. is a total, total upheaval of Palestinian leadership and all of the irredentist, jihadist, 
theological, it was a very good word you used, <laughs> theological commitment. It's a commitment. No less, no less commitment than Jews have. You can't tear out Jerusalem from our heart. Well, the Palestinians, the Palestinians are, the Muslim Palestinian jihadist mentality is, this land is theirs, and you, and you, and you, and you and I stole it from them. We stole that land. It doesn't belong to us. We shouldn't be there. There was an oh, there was a overwhelming Palestinian majority there. What right did you have? Because of the Holocaust, you're going to get this land? Go to Germany and get a piece of land, they say. Mark, I, uh, again, I haven't done a survey here, but I, I'd venture to guess <coughs> that after 1979 in Egypt, after 94 in Jordan, a majority of those respective populations would still say, you guys stole this land. However, we're realistic. Yes. You know, we want to move a bit forward. We'd like to do something for our own people. Egypt signed the peace treaty at a time of enormous poverty uh, within Egypt. And they had an extraordinary leader. And they had an extraordinary leader willing to do that. Now, that Palestinian leadership doesn't exist today. There's no one on the horizon, even, that you might think that. And that's why I think we did say that none of us has any illusions about this plan going much further. Okay. Um, I thought the value of it was is that it reasserted the idea yes. of a two-state solution. And I thought that was a brilliant point. And again, we heard time and time again the Trump administration is not committed to the two-state solution. Netanyahu will never negotiate with the Palestinians, Netanyahu will never accept the idea of a two-state solution. All of that was debunked in one simple meeting. I have another question for you. Oh, right. and, nobody, and nobody reacted to it. You have a U.S. president who stands on the stage, calls for a two-state solution, urges the parties to negotiate, and everybody just rushes in with buckets of cold water just to pour in and, and, and sh show because, this lukewarm support. Because it is Donald J. Trump. Yeah, but bear in mind, Jewish organizations have reacted to this plan. Again, I it can't be uh, universal about right. it, but certainly my own and others that I know of, they've reacted to it with a sense of welcome. Whether we say a breath of fresh air, right. that's more or less what yes, we mean. Yes. Very true. Um, those same Jewish organizations are fully aware that Donald Trump, as you put it, has a very negative image within the Jewish community. Not only is the negative image among the intellectuals and the journalists and the media, it's a very negative image among the people who are in the pews, except for the Orthodox. Now, under those circumstances, for Jewish organizations to be welcoming the plan as a breath of fresh air or as a a point of departure or maybe get negotiations started again, that is a statement that uh, runs against the grain of what you just said about, well, Donald Trump is uh, you know, a, uh, a barbarian uh, by, Jewish, by Jewish communal standards or Jewish communal criteria. Instead of um, buying into that, uh, Jewish organizations, I think, have reacted quite responsibly. By Give me saying, an example. Well, beyond like, the AJC. Beyond the AJC? Yeah. Eric was telling me about a the APAC, APAC plan. statement was fine. The, the APAC statement. What did statement. APAC say? Um, basically, that they thought this was a, an opening, and they really pointed, pointed out about Palestinian rejectionism, as opposed to a J Street, which had a hashtag of peace sham, and, you know, and, and wants to totally undermine any possibility of using this as a stepping stone of what's, of what's there. Does anybody here know what the URJ's reaction was? I haven't seen it, no. Okay. By the way, you were talking about hope. I think there's more hope for this plan and where it can go than there was yeah. in 1900 when somebody said they'll <coughs> become a Jewish state, or maybe in 1945, and you know that that some that at the, at the, after the Holocaust, after the Shoah, something happened. I think there are possibilities, and we really don't know the future. We're not prophets, but. There's always possibilities here, but this, what this plan really did, and hopefully people cannot look at it in a political point of view, is that this took Israel's security interests into account, that those are the absolute minimum security interests of what could be there, and that any plan that goes, and any amount of movement of territory, these type of things cannot go away, and Israel has to defend itself by itself and cannot re re rely upon international help. All right, I hope you're right. Nothing would thrill me more <coughs> if, than a, a movement within the Palestinian world that said, you know what, maybe we're worried about the train leaving. Who cares why? We're ready to sit and talk. And we're ready to, we're ready to, give, up, we're ready to give up two fundamental theological premises. Number one, you stole our land. It's our land. Get off our land. And number two, 
every Palestinian has a right to return to their house in Haifa. By the way, there couldn't be that many houses in Haifa. But every Palestinian throughout the world, every refugee is going to come back to Haifa, Jaffa, and Jerusalem. The Palestinians have to give up the idea that they were going to destroy, destroy Israel, and they have to give up the right of return. If that happens, Eric, I will be thrilled. I want that, because I believe it's good for the Palestinians, and I know it's good for the Israelis. I have a question that I want to... even if it's practical considerations, Mark, I mean, it doesn't have to be... I don't care why. ...theology, practical, and then don't, don't they... forget the missing member of the Trump peace team, one of the most important players in the region, the Iranian regime and Jabhat Zarif who so hand, you know, single-handedly with their Shiite crescent and efforts to destabilize and undermine countries in the region and, and the m more moderate regimes <coughs> has brought Israel together with them. And by doing so, cast a shadow on the Palestinian problem and made them into a much bigger nuisance than they were a few years back. Okay. So. I want to ask you, I have seen, we've all seen editorials in the New York Times mm -hmm. which basically say the following. You've got a president who's being impeached. You've got a prime minister who's facing, who has been indicted. This is just a diversion. This isn't serious. This is politics. And you've got two bums. That's what we see in the New York Times. You've got two bums, Trump and Netanyahu, who are using this peace plan to divert attention from the political scandals they are immersed in. What's your sense? Exactly what we said before, the Trump veil and the Bibi veil. Today in American politics and in general, you can't judge anything unless it's pro-Trump or anti-Trump. In Israel, pro-Netanyahu or anti-Netanyahu. But I'll tell you something worse in the New York Times. It's not that that so much troubles me. More than that, you're seeing an op-ed published yesterday in the New York Times that goes in the line of Yusuf Munayer in The Guardian and talks about the 1917 travesty when the indigenous Palestinians with what Palestinians in 1917 were undermined by the Zionist, uh, uh, the Zionist scheme that was, uh, has been continuously supported by the West. This kind of, of, of um, missing facts, omissions and distortions that tries to take a complicated and boggy issue like the Middle East and, and present it to the general public without presenting them with clear-cut evidence and facts like Palestinian rejectionism over the years, like Ambassador Ayalon stated, that's the real crime. This is the real problem. You know, Mark, these accusations that are being leveled now against the Bibi or, uh, or Trump reminds me of, um, I wasn't present at the time, but uh, May of 1948, when Truman recognized, the first uh, president, the first country that recognized uh, Israel's independence. And there were talks also and accusations, well, Trump is doing, uh, Truman. Truman is doing it only because of his political benefit. November, six months later, we're going to have elections here, and he is facing a very, very rough time. It's beside the point. Let's even say that they do it because of diversion. You think in 100 years from now, if there is real peace, anybody will care Anybody will even notice, and this is, I think, what people should look at. Just try to get out of the political bubble and try to look at it objectively, yes. and this one, is the issue. Well, yes. one, one simple historical footnote just to remind everyone. Truman in May of 1948 uh, knew he was going to face Thomas Dewey, governor of New York. There wasn't a chance, there wasn't a snowball's chance that Truman would carry New York because right. Dewey was a very popular right. governor. Right. To say that Truman did it entirely for political reasons I think is you know, unfair to Truman, number one, and number two, a misreading of history. But the real point uh, I think Ambassador Ayalon is making that's very important here is that um, political considerations and substantive considerations or considerations of justice are not necessarily at odds with one another. They can run in the same direction. <clears throat> when uh, Clinton was facing impeachment and uh, he launched an attack on uh, um, I guess it was um, uh, Bin Laden, he didn't succeed, but he launched the attack. Immediately people said, this is wag the dog. You know, in other words, why is Clinton doing this? Because he's in trouble, he's got impeachment, so he turns to foreign affairs. How many, other, how many of those same people would say it was wrong to attack Bin Laden? How many of them would have wished the attack would have been more successful? So that there may very well be political considerations here working on both sides. It does not mean the initiative is 
unjust or unfair. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, anymore you cannot in this uh, world of today you can divorce political issues and diplomatic and foreign policy. And, but to one of your concerns that you uh, raised or your question about the missing Palestinian interlocutor here, I think this is also the fresh approach of the president. For the first time, and, and Shahar put it very well, the first time there is a price to pay by the Palestinians. It's not that they are going to be this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, spoiled brat anymore, that unless they acquiesce and give us their kindness to agree to some kind of a, uh, a, um, com you know, a compromise, nothing will move. And here it is stopping for once the uh, Palestinian tail, I would say, wagging the entire Middle Eastern Very dog. By the way, our crack producers have brought me Rick Jacobs and the URJ's response. I want to read it to you and then get your response to it. Rick Jacobs, president of the Union for Reform Judaism, the Organization of Reform Judaism, writes, We laud all efforts to bring peace and firmly believe that a secure Israel, side by side with a viable Palestinian state, is in the best interest of American foreign policy and, of course, for the future of Israel. In this regard, we are especially concerned about Prime Minister Netanyahu's statement at the White House saying he will establish unilaterally Israeli law over all those West Bank settlements and the Jordan Valley proposed for final status under the Trump plan. We believe that this move towards annexation is dangerous for Israel's future and for stability and peace of the region overall. And then he concludes, all these efforts towards peace evoke, we evolve, as these efforts towards peace evolve, we will continue to advocate for and work toward a day of peace and security for the people of Israel and for the Palestinians. What do you think about Rick Jacobs being upset that Netanyahu is saying he's going to extend Israeli law and annex portions of the West without Bank? Having, without having that stick without having that ability to get things going on the ground, that, that hidden threat within the initiative, you're taking away the impetus for the Palestinians to move. You're giving them de facto veto power over any kind of progress. And to me, that's the thing that had been tried so many times in the past. They said no to such far-reaching plans, including to what was perceived at the time to be a favorable administration under Obama, Ben Rhodes, and the Kerry Initiative. And I'll remind you that in the Israeli psyche, we will never forget that Palestinian rejectionism of the Kerry Initiative, of the Israeli withholding or free zone settlements at the beginning of Obama's term, was and, and continuous calls by Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Israeli government for negotiations with the Palestinians was answered by Palestinian rejectionism, which in turn resulted in what? Punishment for the Palestinians? No. December 23 of 2016, applause at the chambers of the Security Council of the United Nations as the resolution is taken, not vetoed by the United States, and Israel is being put on the spot when it came to the settlements, thus inviting international interference in what was up to that point something that should only be handled by the party. So we were already struck by Palestinian rejectionism leading to the punishment of Israel, I don't think we need to try again what had been tried so many times. Okay, I'm asking you specifically, is, uh, uh, has Netanyahu backed off the notion of extending Israeli law to portions of the West Bank? To the best of my knowledge, officially, no. Yeah. Okay. There was a report this get, morning. Yeah. I, I read definitely the, report this morning saying yeah. we're going to wait. We're going to wait a little bit. In which um, case it behooves, I think, all of us and all friends of Israel to say let these things unfold. Yeah. Yeah. This exactly. is a matter of yeah. formulation of policy. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't brought up the judgment. Really, By the way, in yeah. fair to Rick yeah. Jacobs, this was issued two days ago before the change. Exactly. Right. So right. this morning does yeah. make a difference. Right. But right. Right. one of the things really important, uh, Shahar is re referring to UN Security Council Resolution um, uh, 2334, which basically made every place over the 49 armistice line an international war crime, and the president's abstention undermined UN Resolution uh, 242, which was the basis of uh, uh, territories. And we're dealing with the aftermath of that. The Trump plan here really has attacked that directly, because with that plan, what President Obama basically did in Kerry is they created the Western Wall as an international war crime. I think here, 
it's incredibly important to make it very clear that territory is an important part here, but the other things that go along about accepting a Jewish state, as UN Security Council, a UN um, uh, General Assembly Resolution 181 said, a Jewish and an Arab state. There were no Palestinians at that point of time. No, we were all Palestinians. We were all well, Palestinians. Well, if you had a passport, it was Palestinian. Palestinian right. Jews and Palestinian <laughs> Arabs. Pal Palestine Post. <laughs> right, Palestine Post, the place by, by right for. You know, there's some historians now called the 48th yeah, War of Independence right. a civil war because the Palestinian, the Arabs, attack their Palestinian Jews. Very true. Interesting. Uh, so important, so important for the viewers to take note of this point, that, that the word Palestinian at that time, before 1948, referred to Jews and Arabs alike. Yes, so don't the, tell me that the Palestinians were negated in 1917 by the Balfour Declaration. I can't go there. I don't feel that's fair. <laughs> Incidentally, I will point out that in the World's Fair, World Fair of 1939, 39. the Palestinian pavilion was Jewish. Um, one last one last issue that I wanted. I, you, you mentioned this in your opening comments. There are people who were disappointed that it seems that it was a very partisan event right. at the White House. To the best of my knowledge, I know of no Democrat who was there. That doesn't mean I don't have any inside knowledge. I don't know that Democrats were invited and wouldn't come, but I know they weren't there. And at the same time, you, you mentioned, if it's Trump, there's a knee-jerk reaction. You talked about how he's a barbarian. In Jewish communities. That's, and that's the way, that's a good word. Um, but here is, I want you to see what some of the Democratic candidates for their party's nomination said about the plan, and then I just want reaction. Can we put up what Joe Biden said, what his uh, comment was as he responded to the uh, peace plan, if we have it. If we don't have it, let me know. Do we have it? Joe Biden. Let's see. I think we have it coming up. Okay. Well, that's Bernie Sanders. We'll take it. I'll, I'll take I'm not Bernie sure. Sa I'll take Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders said, any acceptable peace deal must be consistent with international law and multiple UN Security Council resolutions. It must end the Israeli occupation that began in 1967 and enable Palestinian self-determination in an independent, democratic, economically viable state of their own along a, a, alongside a secure and democratic state of Israel. Do we have any others or we'll leave that alone? Uh, this is also Trump. Trump's, so, this is Bernie Sanders. Trump's so-called peace deal doesn't come close and will only perpetuate the conflict and undermine the security interests of Americans, Israelis, and Palestinians. It is unacceptable. Do we have Warren? Let's put up Warren. Warren, releasing a plan without negotiating with Palestinians isn't diplomacy. It's a sham. I will oppose unilateral annexation in any form and reverse any policy that supports it. Bloomberg. Every peace plan deserves a chance, but any viable plan requires buy-in from both sides. He says, as this pr uh, process unfolds, it is critical that neither party take unilateral steps that could trigger instability and violence. Buttigieg, peace requires both parties at the table, not a political green light, to the leader of one for unilateral annexation. Okay. Pan Somebody react. Pandering to the extremes of a party is what goes on during an election season. I'll play a defense that they will go out if that's not how they'll necessarily govern. Having said that, um, the statements previously of Warren and Sanders in particular have not been, have been harshly critical of Israel in many ways. Um, and so I expect what they said there is fairly close to what they really mean. Okay, you deal with this all the time. Well, look, if we, uh, again, if we search our memory banks a bit, uh, Sanders in New York City in 2016, you know, Jewish capital of America, you know, basically was far more brazen in his attack on Netanyahu at that point. So actually, if you compare the two statements, where at one point he says Netanyahu was the primary obstacle to peace, here he's saying it won't, the Trump plan won't come close. It's far less of a, I don't say it's far less, by comparison to what he was saying back in 2016, he's running for elections, you put it, I don't think he's changed his views at all. 
but essentially he sees uh, he sees Israel as an obstacle to peace. Okay, but, what, uh, but yeah. well, why isn't anybody willing to acknowledge Palestinian intransigence? Why anybody is not willing to be honest in saying we call upon Palestinians to come back to the negotiation? The guy wouldn't take a phone call from the President of the United States. They wouldn't sit with, with U.S. negotiators, not, not last week, last month, but for, for a couple of years now they wouldn't engage. So everybody just disregards this fact and continues as if the Palestinians have been there, have tried, and that's the best they could do. That to me is unacceptable and, and undermines the very factual reality we live in. And I am, by the way, I go on record, you know, this, this has been the way I've been brought up. I've been brought up a traditional Jewish kid, liberal parents who were profoundly part of the Democratic Party. I am so disappointed. I am so disappointed. We have to wrap up. So I want 15, 20 seconds. Bottom line, as you look at this, what's your overall comment? 15, 20 seconds. What it should be is a call for a return to the negotiating table. What it will be is that as long as you have Palestinian transitions, there'll be no progress. And therefore, I, I can't be optimistic about the plan, but yes, I do see a positive elements within it. Danny. I think Israel should no longer have its uh, hands tied either by the Palestinians or the intransigence or the international community. So if indeed the Palestinians should have their fair chance to review and come to the negotiating table, but if they don't, I think there is no other choice for Israel but to take unilateral uh, steps for its own national interests. And, um, you know, we do not have an eastern border yet, only because of the Palestinians. So it's time to move on. And I'm very, it's very deplorable that uh, it has become a partisan issue. The entire thing of Israel, not just the, not just the peace plan. And I, I would say that this uh, democratic... Uh, um, uh, you know, candidates, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian uh, ambassadors would not have spoken better about uh, this plan than they. Why are they jumping in and giving some ideas before they hear the Palestinians even? I think we have to remember that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not the Gordian knot to untie for peace in the region. And American national security interests need a secure and strong Israel. Um, for our interests, because that helps us on so many levels. And so we cannot, we can be a honest broker, but we don't want to be a neutral broker going here. I'll Last comment. End, I'll end with a forward-looking proposal. Let's not use the term Middle East peace anymore, referring to peace between Israel and the Palestinians, because Middle East peace is taking place here and now between Israel and the Gulf, between Israel and Saudi Arabia, between Israel and many parts of the Arab world. Let there be Middle East peace and the Israeli-Palestinian settlement process. I cannot thank the four of you enough. You know, um, there are other places there are interesting discussions, but I cannot imagine having four people as thoughtful and, to, and raising such fabulous issues as the four of you did. Steve, Danny, Eric, and Shahar, thank you so very, very much. You're always going to be at this table, all four of you. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. I hope you found the insights of Steve Bain, Danny Ayalon, Eric Mandel, and Shahar Azani helpful as you think, think through your own reaction to the Trump administration peace plan. And of course, as always, I'd love to know what you think. Do you think the Trump administration peace plan has any chance of bearing fruit? Please email me your thoughts to Rabbi Golub at jbstv.org. A quick note in closing to all of you who sent me such loving notes, even offers of chicken soup, Barbara and Joan, while I was recovering from pneumonia, you touched me deeply. I am most grateful. I love you all. As always, I thank the wonderful JBS crew to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, editor, Albert Kahn, Tisha Bader in our news department, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.